Uh, well, uh, good afternoon. It's a, a very great pleasure to be here today uh, to uh, talk to the, uh, the Asian Summit of Cornet, having addressed both the summit in Salt Lake City of the Cornet Group and also uh, the, uh, the group within the European Union. And I want to look at real trends, uh, real estate trends in Asia as a whole, but with a particular interest in China. Um, and uh, in India, because uh, these are two very important uh, growing markets. And uh, I want to uh, collect together, if I can, some of the themes you began to hear yesterday on the future of the economy of the region, how we do business in the region, and some of the other aspects of technology, outsourcing, and the rest. And I want to take us further into the future and to make us think about the horizon of uh, maybe five or six or seven years further ahead. So that's my purpose. Um, you are all futurists. Each of us thinks a lot about the future. We turn on CNN in the hotel and we see today and we think about the future. You have your own view about what will happen as a result of the Iraq war. Uh, you have your own view of what will happen uh, to the future of your own industry. Uh, each of us are futurists, and as a fellow futurist, I want to share with you a simple model that I have found very useful in talking with the boards and senior teams of many multinational companies. It spells the word future, F-U-T-U-R-E, um, and uh, I hope you find it useful as a model. The first word of the future is fast, and it's to do with the speed of change. And as recent events have shown, the world has changed far faster than you to respond. I think about some of the huge buildings going up in Shanghai that were first planned six or seven years ago and will not open for another 18 months and will not achieve full occupancy for maybe another three years beyond that, by which time the whole world has changed. So, my friends, if it's important in most industries to see the future, it is absolutely vital for you, in particular, to have a very profound view of the future. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about Iraq, uh, whether it was the way that the world changed after Enron, uh, what uh, the uh, increasing wealth of transparency in Wall Street, whether it's corporate governance, which is also a particular issue here, whether it's issues relating to transparency, the ups and downs of the market, uh, all kinds of challenges are there for us. Who here has been in a company which has been eaten by another company, or you have eaten someone else in the last three years? Put your hands up. Okay. Straight away, you have fundamental challenges. Uh, on every aspect of your organization. We can get overtaken by events in corporate real estate. One of the challenges is that those who are in corporate real estate get detached from the decisions which are being made at board level. And one of the major opportunities for us is to reconnect these things together. Logistics, infrastructure, corporate real estate with the strategic vision for the organization. So we have a uh, or reorganization, which means that the HQ you are already building is, is out of date. It's in the wrong place, in the wrong city. We have to change again. Uh, we have a situation where country operations are opened or closed before you have the time to even make some money. Uh, where whole organizations change in a month. Where every part of uh, your technology requirements is changing faster than you can redesign your buildings. So, how do we keep all our options open? Where do we go next? Well, the first thing to be careful about is market research. Whatever you do, don't believe what your customers tell you when it comes to the future. Who here has, uh, has run out of power on your PC in a transatlantic flight? Or a long flight? Okay. Who here has run out of power on your second battery? Anybody run out on the third battery? I flattened three whole batteries on the way here. 
And you know, different airlines have different attitudes. Some have got into real troubles over market research. British Airways believes in market research, and they, in 1996-7, started to ask people what they wanted. And we all said the same thing. We said, um, well, more movies, better beds. In fact, we want a bed in business class. We'd like more flights to be on time. Uh, we would like a few other things. We would also like a data socket to collect and receive email. But nobody mentioned power in 1996. But my friends, what is the point of a data socket for email when your third battery is dead? Oh, you need wireless now. You need wireless now. Yes, I know, but you still need power for the PC. <laughs> okay. Yes, I'd like wireless broadband on the plane. That's what I really want. But, and I'm going to get it too. But the problem is this. American Airlines, you see, took a different view. American Airlines knows that you listen to your customers, but you don't believe them. American Airlines knew that uh, you get close to your customers, you get close to your internal customers, you get close to your clients, you get close to those who, who you're outsourcing to, you get close to your business. You find out what makes them think. Then you create a vision of the, what the future will be like over here. And you move your customers in your mind into that future. American Airlines did the same market research that British Airways did. And they got the same answers. But American Airlines realized that in 2002 or 2003, all of us would need to be using email, PowerPoint, and everything else all the time on a big flight. And so in 1997, they began to put power sockets not only in the business seats, but even in the very, very old, bashed up, uh, really wrecked old planes and they were built in the 1960s, they started to put power sockets in those economy seats too. And so in the year 2003, on an American Airlines flight, you fly in power everywhere. On British Airways over here in business class, I still didn't have a power socket. So what we learned, therefore, is you, is you listen to your customers, but you don't believe them. Uh, we need to find a different way. Now, if we can't listen to our customers, then we need a real vision of our own. And uh, here it is. Here are some thoughts I have, and you can uh, test them with your own. My own view is that uh, we will continue to see the, the mega mergers and uh, some mega mergers and continuing consolidation and the big high profile uh, prestige HQ. We're seeing it here in Asia. We will continue to see it in Europe. But we will also see some very embarrassing mistakes uh, as a result of restructuring. We will continue to see questions about what business you're in. Are you in the business of real estate? If you are a multinational company, is your primary business investment in real estate or is it to do the business? And so we will continue to see many large organizations contracting out, leasing back, selling off their, uh, whatever it is, getting rid of the capital on their balance sheet so they can use that money to invest in their real business. The trouble is, once you have released the capital from, uh, that is in your real estate portfolio, it's very difficult to go back again to that. It's very difficult to raise that amount of money. So it's a one-way ticket. But we will see it a lot uh, uh, more than we have done in the past. We are also, of course, profound changes in the way that people are working, and I'm going to come back to that. With every aspect of our society changing faster than we could possibly imagine. And if this is true in the UK, if it's true in the US, if it's true in Germany, if it's true that, uh, that these changes are taking place in lifestyle in the West, then it's particularly so in the East. Why? Because in the East, we're able to leapfrog right over from one technology to another. Uh, and, you know, it was the case even five years ago that in Delhi, I had a better phone system than I did in New York on my mobile. In a developing country, you can just put one aerial on top of a hotel roof with a satellite dish, and suddenly everybody has 3G broadband mobile video phones. It's, the, uh, it's, the, it's, it's Germany that struggles. It's France that struggles. So we have a huge capacity for technological leapfrogging, bringing uh, emerging economies right into a totally new world, which is really very exciting. Um, and by the way, forget the net. The net is a last century idea. 
that people don't really understand is the power of the video phone and what it's going to do. You know, people have been talking about whether video is useful or not. Let me tell you this, video will be on every phone and it will be used and it will totally change the way in which you and other organizations behave globally. I'll tell you why. Who watched a report on a video phone on CNN in the last 48 hours? You have seen the power of video. And then you see the disappointment when you just have a phone call of a news report. There's something about the power of an image to locate the individual in their world. It shows you exactly what's happening at Dubai in the, uh, uh, speak at the Global International Emirates Summit. And uh, there was Microsoft there, there was Hewlett Packard, IBM, all the biggest companies in the world. I was the only one to actually have a PC out here. I said to one of the guys after, I said, why is it that you are these tech companies, you have this technology, you have the software, you have the hardware, you have absolutely everything in the whole world to make these things work? He said, it doesn't work, he said, that's why we don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, big cities have great future. And I guess one of the challenges is what's going to happen next. And the people said London was going to die. That was nonsense. London itself has increased in population by over a million people in the last few years. Um, in the last 10 years. And of course, Shanghai increased by maybe two, three, four, five million. What's going to happen next? Well, we still have 500 million people within China alone who are ready to move to cities. It's impossible to imagine the impact of this over the next 10 to 20 years. In India, we have another 350 million people who are ready to move to mega cities. In fact, we have half the world's population already drifting to the outer edges of cities uh, with very few, little infrastructure and yet tremendous drive to the economy. We're talking about a world where two thirds of our population, even in this country, is living on less than one or two dollars a day. My wife and I had an interesting experience yesterday uh, we went through two sides of the same Shanghai railway station. One side was Manhattan, and the other side was the streets of Delhi. It was a strange experience. One side, multi-stories. The other side, some of the worst slums in the world. Very great contrast. And yet in the middle of it is tremendous hope. In fact, in India alone, you'll see a larger middle class than you have in the whole of the UK, uh, the seventh largest economy. Uh, and uh, these, this uh, um, is uh, going to create all kinds of challenges for us. Because when it comes to corporate real estate at the moment, there's a real shortage of uh, service companies, of people who really understand what it is to operate within, say, Shanghai on the one hand for part of a multinational operation, and Hong Kong on another, Delhi, Bangkok, uh, and all the rest of it. These are very, very complex demands. Many of the companies I work with are frustrated because they cannot find people in this room who are able to deliver service into more than one continent, more than one country. And I believe there's going to be a very significant role for those of you who can truly partner together with agents, fixers on the ground in a wide variety of different countries. Uh, these women here are part of the banking project in India. This is one of the most exciting things I've ever seen in the world. My wife and I were there just recently. We saw 40,000 of these women being lifted out of absolute poverty simultaneously. They were living in tents, but now they are owning two or three story houses. They are running their own businesses. They are rebuilding their own hotels. Maybe they are not in, this, in the market yet for corporate real estate, but they are part of the engine of growth for the future. So watch out. Uh, these countries are going to see phenomenal economic growth and uh, also uh, with it social tensions and challenges of all kinds. The big question will be where do you put your HQs in the future? Where do you put your spectacular buildings for the future? Well, whether you're east or west, north or south, of course, infrastructure is everything and communication is everything. And we will still expect to see an absolute premium in a globalized world for all HQs that are within 15 minutes of an international hub. And of course we're beginning to see in cities like Shanghai some of the, uh, the, the uh, trends that we've seen in the past in Europe with a shortage of space, stricter planning, and more regulations, uh, high expectations, uh, and, other, and other things. Fast, urban, tribal. Tribalism 
is the most powerful force in the world today. It's more powerful than the, the, U, the U.S., the Chinese, and the Russian armies. Tribalism is also the most powerful positive force, but it's at the root of all conflict. It's the root of every terrorist act. The Iraq war, you could say, is part of a tribal conflict between East and West on the one hand, but also between groups even within Iraq on the other. And now we have tribal conflict on top of tribal conflict. We have the Turkish people coming in. Why? Because they're coming, they are wanting to prevent a further tribal conflict between Turks and Kurds, between Kurds and Iraqis. Our future world will be dominated by tribal forces. And with it is a challenge for you as global real estate companies. How do you operate in a tribal world? How do you ensure that the policies that you have will work with a community here in Shanghai just as comfortably as on the streets of Hong Kong, a very different place, uh, and again in Moscow or Madrid? And this is a key challenge for you in corporate real estate because few issues are more tribal than property. Where you plant your building, who you employ, what that building will look like, what the conditions of service will be for those who are working inside that building. Especially if you are providing a one-stop solution, not just building the building, but providing the workforce, selecting, training, recruiting, and the rest. And yet tribalism is the most powerful positive force in the world today. Uh, it's what glues us together. In fact, every successful organization represented here right now is a tribe. In fact, Cornet is a tribe. I'm sorry, it's a, two tribes combined into one, of course, 12 months ago. But every brand becomes a tribe. And the most successful organizations are the most successful tribes. 60% of all mergers lost shareholder value over the last three to four years. That's, uh, that's a business uh, week statistic from last October. One of the reasons why 60% of mergers tend to fail in terms of generating this great value is because of the difficulties that we have often in bringing these two tribal cultures together. So tribalism is at right at the very heart of everything that we do to create successful organizations. And corporate real estate will continue to be very tribal. Watch for this issue. Buildings create drives. They say, oh, I work at number three. Oh, we're at number five. Or, no, we're a fifth floor. I'm a, I'm a fifth floor person. Oh, 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 we're on the number seven. That's where the executives are. We have these tribes within tribes. Buildings create their own personality, their own history. Uh, those of us who had great privilege last night to be at the M on the Bund uh, saw what it was uh, to be in a building with, with its own culture. It speaks to us. Those big buildings along that, sh uh, that, uh, that waterfront speak to us of the personalities of the past, which is why so many buildings got pulled down during the communist era. Tribes, uh, tribes create buildings, and buildings themselves have a personality of their own. Fast, urban, tribal, universal. Universal is to do with globalization, of course, and the powerful trend to make everything the same everywhere. And so we see McDonald's. I've never seen so many McDonald's as I saw on Sunday afternoon in Tokyo. I have never, ever, in any country of the world, seen so many McDonald's outlets. And yet that very globalization of McDonald's produces the reaction. So, for example, in the Middle East, McDonald's is now having to close down outlets because there's a reaction against this globalized, English-speaking, Americanized culture. Because the more universal we get, the more tribal we want to be. And the more tribal we are, often the more people hunger to be part of the universal. It's a strange thing. So the future of Europe is going to be a conflict between two great forces. Universalism, on the one hand, the desire to all be one. On the other hand, tribalism, the need to have our own independent cultures and languages. And in the standoff right now today between Britain and France over the Iraq conflict, you see tribalism at work. Um, at the same time as you see the desire for universalism. These are strange times and they will affect profoundly 
the nature of corporate real estate. And in our universal world today, we are reminded of a single superpower and the tremendous stresses and strains that this creates in the geopolitical environment. The digital society gave us the global village and globalization gave us the rules for trading within it. But neither have explained to us how to live in harmony inside this tiny virtual space. So we have a crazy situation today on CNN. A woman who is an Islamic woman within a burqa, outside her home and unveiled within it, can be watching with her two daughters, young daughters, a CNN broadcast, and suddenly it changes to the advertising break, and she is horrified to see uh, women with virtually no clothes on in acts of simulated intercourse over a motor car. And in her shock and her scandalization for the sake of her daughters, she turns off CNN and she feels that she has had her home violated morally by the advertisement that her daughters have seen. On the one hand. On the other hand, in the bar, in the coffee bar of Starbucks in Manhattan, I can sit and watch the same CNN broadcast at the same moment. And the very next news item is a shows a woman with a burqa with her two daughters being walked through the slums of Pakistan. And at that moment I hear a voice in me saying, and that's why these women need to be freed from oppression. Because on the one hand, we have the woman who is scandalized by the, what she sees as sexual immorality invading her home and violating the very, very nature of her existence. On the other hand, in another part of the world, and it could easily have been in London, or Paris, or Madrid, or even in Moscow, and another part of the world, we see another community who are scandalized that the woman even wears a veil over her face, because she is clearly oppressed and in need of deliverance. So this is the challenge of the virtual digital village. How do we live inside this small space? And there's a further challenge too. Here we see uh, the effect of globalization, huge rapid growth of globalization. 4.6 million people now live in the global village. And yet the international governance is struggling to catch up. So we have seen the Kyoto Treaty, we have seen uh, the International War Crimes Tribunal, we have seen a whole host of other issues, we have seen the UN begin to um, gather people together to try to create a unity. But in a global village, we have very little global governance at the moment. And we have two world views. We are at a point in history today, even today, as we sit in this room, history is being made. When the history books are written, whatever your views on the war, whatever mine are, when the history books are written in 2015, they will record that this week was the beginning of a transition, a difficult time, between the old and the new, between the second millennium and the third millennium, between the view that every nation is a nation state and that every nation has autonomy and is, has the right to defend itself, which is a traditional second millennial view. And on the other hand, a third millennial, very, very controversial view, a minority view in the world today, which is that in a global village, you have to have a global government. You have to have a global order. And if someone misbehaves in the global village, you send in the global police. And if the global police get shot, you send in the global army and you sort it out. That is a minority view. And that is the debate within the UN today. Are we in the nation, are we in the age of the nation state where each of you as nations on each table has national autonomy and the right to determine your own future? Or are we in the global village in a different kind of world order, in a globalized community where if one goes down, we all go down? where we all have to find a way to live in harmony together, where what happens in the environment in one country can create smog across a whole continent, where a virus that is unleashed in one country 
uh, for genetically modified food or whatever it is, or even some biological experiment can affect the whole Earth. These are the challenges that we face. And these are difficult times. And as I say, history will record that this week was very significant in the settlement of that issue. Are we to go back and re-establish the fundamental rules of international law as they have been for the last hundred years and say this is the way we should live? Or are we to say that we are now entering a new world, a new order, and we have to find a different model for global existence altogether? My friends, this is the challenge that we face. And it's a difficult one, because all the while the world is changing. It doesn't stop for the United Nations. The processes of the digital world, of globalization, the shrinking of our global village, this tiny cultural space, all of these things impose challenges of their own on every multinational company. And the reason why this is important is that many of the companies represented here have a higher turnover per year than the GDP of the, t of the bottom 30 nations of the world. So we have a situation where global multinationals are part of the system and cannot be separated from it. And that is why even decisions about where you put your HQ become difficult. And of course, where you uh, re remove the costs of trading things like currency but through technology, and you release, as is happening in China and elsewhere, the rules uh, that prevented movement of goods and services and foreign exchange, then you create the potential for further instability. And you can expect a lot more wobbles like this, where the currencies can go up or down of a country by 75 or 80 percent or more. And each time it does, in this part of the world, there is a tension. Because if speculators push the currency further down than it should go, if a, a factory that you own, a part of your corporate real estate, is suddenly worth only a quarter of what it was. If the loan is still sitting there, if your business is now insolvent, if the banks pull in that loan, if your business is bankrupted, and I'm thinking of a small manufacturer, for example, in Thailand, who is selling maybe to someone here, um, who has grown from one factory to 50 in Thailand over the last 10 years. And you are the major monopoly buyer of this whole group. And this whole group has gone bust. Here is the question. Who buys these factories? Who has the money when the Thai currency falls to the floor? And of course, it's foreign money that is there and ready to buy. And picks up, this is the lesson of history, and each time there is this wobble, it comes back up and ownership has changed. So we land up with a net devaluation of maybe 20%, but a significant amount of the equity, the, the wealth of that nation, has shifted hands. And that is why we are seeing such profound unease, not just about the Iraq war, but about the process of globalization itself. I have met this man, he is not mad and he is not a murderer. And when he spoke recently in the Middle East about globalization, he had a standing ovation. You know today, if there was a global UN that was more powerful, if there was an election where six billion people had a vote to elect the president of the world, I believe there is one individual above all that would win, and his name is Nelson Mandela. I do not see any other person on the face of the earth today that would win as many votes to be the moral president of the, Uni of the United Nations, of the whole world community, than Nelson Mandela himself. So listen to his words. He said recently at the Southern African Economic Summit, he described globalization like this. He said that he believed that uncontrolled globalization was a world evil on southern African countries than 350 years of imperialism and slavery. Now these are powerful words, not from just uh, any politician, but from someone who carries a huge moral authority in the world today. So watch out my friends, it's not just the anti-war demonstrations and things like that, 
we're talking about a very big unease, a question about the kind of world that we're creating for the future. And uh, we can expect the next 10 years to be dominated by these issues. What about corporate real estate in a globalized world? Well, as I've said, the challenge is to think globally yourselves. Corporate real estate is very tribal. You know, if you understand Shanghai culture, that's great, but it won't necessarily help you in Beijing. You've made your money by being the best fixers on the earth in Shanghai, perhaps. But it doesn't make you a good fixer in Mumbai, because these are very important uh, local skills that can't necessarily just be transported and dumped into another territory. And yet, as I say, there's a huge demand in the globalized world for people who can think and act globally. So forget the old pyramid structures. What you're going to see in uh, real estate is much more of an a, a informal networking, alliances, partnerships, uh, rearrangements of all kinds of business relationships. And another challenge will be to move the, the uh, core real estate business into the very heart of the management process. So it's integrated with HR and IT in particular. So we take a coherent view of what real estate will be like and when we're opening a factory, for instance, or a new office. Bring those things together. You know, um, can I just see a show of hands? Who here has traveled more than 40 times in the last year on a plane? Who here has traveled twice as much in the last two years as in the previous two years before that, despite September 11th? So, my friends, what happens next year? What we're dealing with is, a, is a, actually a very unsustainable model, I think you'll agree. It's a, actually a profound challenge of our time. How do you manage increasingly globalized operations, or indeed national operations? In a country as large as India or China, it's impossible, as you well know, to do business countrywide without an extraordinary amount of air travel. We're going to have to find other ways to work. And uh, one of them is technology. In, uh, um, in Japan, where we j have just come from, my wife and I were sitting in the hotel room, and we walked in there, and uh, it was the same in the hotel here. We saw the Ethernet connection, and I thought, that's great. It's not wireless, but at least it's broadband. So I plugged it in, and straight away, at zero cost, we were connected to the net, at um, an unbelievable speed. I mean, I have two megabits per second at home, wireless, and this must have been five. This is two or three times faster than any connection I've ever had in my life in this Japanese hotel room. So I think to myself, this is great. So I said to Sheila, well, why don't we call home? And uh, so I, I plugged in our $35 camera and, uh, 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 and called home. And immediately, a huge video wall in our house lights up, and my wife and I are there sitting in my office home, at home. There's no one there, of course. <laughs> They're all downstairs. Cause, uh, so we're now sitting in my office, uh, which is where we might be anyway. Um, but, uh, so we then had to, had to, had to call down uh, to uh, say, Hi, is anybody there? Still nobody can hear us. <laughs> so I had to dial my, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, our daughter, Elizabeth, on a mobile phone to get her off the other phone in the house uh, to actually come up and say hello. <laughs> And there we were, but the point is this, uh, that we were there on a, on a screen uh, which is about like this, okay, so we were there life size, and Elizabeth was sitting here, and here's the screen joined to the desk. So we're sitting opposite each other, and she's seeing us life size, and the point is this, that the video call cost us nothing. And in fact, uh, we decided just for fun, just to leave it running. Well, why not? I mean, you know, life's too short. I, listen, the idea of booking a video conference is really last century. You know, we don't need it. What we need to be thinking about is a world where we can connect each other together. So maybe uh, you work in Singapore and you're in Shanghai um, and you're in Madrid and you're in New York and you're part of the same global real corporate real estate services group and you provide consultancy and outsourcing to all kinds of multinationals. My friends, what we can do is just split a screen like that up into four or we can have four data projectors, one for each of your walls, and you can share an office together. And, you, you know, I, I was testing my video conference equipment before placing a traditional lab 
mandatory ISDN data video call to America recently because it was a company that couldn't do the IP, couldn't do the internet. Uh, uh, one of the world's top IT companies, which I dare not name, but you can might guess, some incredibly powerful IT company that cannot, cannot actually do what we did in the Japanese hotel room. Okay, they're still doing, do you know how much it costs? By the way, I made a mistake. I use this stuff so often and you just leave it running and it costs you nothing. I forgot it was on data calls. Do you know how much that, by the time I, I, went, to, I went to see a client, did some other things, went downstairs, had, had a meal with my family, went up, just quickly checked my email and just shutting up, oh my word, this video call's been running a long time on ISDN. How, guess how much the ISDN call cost to the US for 14 hours? $1,800. $1,800. One, that was an expensive mouse click. $1,800. Do you know, for $1,800, I can buy broadband in two of your offices and the phones and everything else for a whole year. So this, my friends, is the revolution. Forget the idea of doing a video conference together. Think about a world which is totally wired and wireless, wired up but wireless, Actually, I walked, we walked in here, I saw the Ethernet connection, I said, hey, this is great, we're a long way from home. It would be very nice to find out how the kids are. And by the way, video tells you lots of things. Especially if it's your kids. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, it, actually we couldn't do it because the broadband here in the, in the hotel isn't quite connected yet. But I've discovered it's there in the business center. So what I, the point I'm making is it's going to change very dramatically. I thought you might like to see one of the video calls we made. This is uh, before I flew to no Tokyo, met Sheila there. Uh, I was in uh, Phoenix. And this is the call that happened in Phoenix, if it's going to play. Perhaps it's not. Actually, I don't think it's going to play. That's a pity. Um, but uh, this is a video call. Uh, there's, there's Paul. You can see me holding up the camera. So I've got a camera looking at a camera, looking at him, looking at me. Um, but it costs almost nothing to do it. Um, now, I'm just saying, think about, think again about the kind of offices you're building. You're building offices today that are going to be, so you've got the same problem as a plane. The American Airlines plane, designed in 1996, delivered in 2002, is supposed to have a life of about 20 years, and certainly a 10-year IT life. So it should not be cut from the IT point of view till 2013. I think that's similar to a building. So we need to be stretching ourselves very much into the future when it comes to thinking about how people are going to work. That's urban travel universal. Radical. Radical is about radical new ways of working, about creative options, new models, thinking the unthinkable, planning facilities that your board doesn't even know they need yet. But actually it goes further than that. Radical is about the death of political thinking, the death of old left-right, the death of communism versus capitalism, the fusion of all kinds of ideologies and ideas and lifestyles and convictions and ways of doing things. We see it in China, we've seen it in India, we see it in Russia, we see it in America. And we're seeing a new kind of politics. And we see it here in China just as much as we're seeing it in Europe. The death of the old ideology on the one hand and the replacement by single issues on the other. Single issue might be the war against terror. It could be abortion. It could be uh, population control. It could be the environment. It could be land use. It could be conservation. And the real challenge for you is that single issues are hugely powerful and have tremendous emotional power, uh, emotional energy, which can go way beyond the particular issue. So you can have an issue, uh, let's say a Swiss bank. You can have an issue, uh, let's say, to do with... Uh, um, how the Jewish population was treated during the Second World War and what happened to the gold in the bank accounts. That's a 50-year-old issue. It's 60 years old now. And every year, that issue was reviewed by the bank. And suddenly, it becomes a live issue. 55 years on, after the war, it becomes a live issue. Powerful enough to change the whole of national policy on banking when it comes to secrecy. Here is another example. The Brent Spa oil rig in the UK was an oil rig that was dirty and uh, the SO wanted to sink it, uh, so Shell wanted to sink it in the North Sea. It was a contaminated structure 
everyone agreed except for Greenpeace. Greenpeace put activists on top of the oil rig. They succeeded in getting media attention. They got a global boycott of Shell products. And Shell changed their mind and decided to bring the oil rig onto the land. Greenpeace said the oil rig was full of toxic waste and it was immoral to sink this rig. Okay? A y six months later, after the decision was made not to sink it in the sea, Greenpeace had a press conference and said that they were very sorry they'd made a huge mistake and that actually this oil rig was empty and should be sunk immediately. Friends of the Earth agreed. All the government experts agreed in Germany and in the UK. But the governments would not sink it. Shell would not sink it. Both the German Chancellor and the Prime Minister in Britain lost their elections and two new governments came in, but still no one would sink the rig. But listen, my friends, every environmentalist, every single issue activist said, sink the rig, please sink it. It's far safer to sink it in the land. We just made a mistake. And eight or nine years later, those rigs, that rig is still floating on the sea. And it will float on the sea probably almost forever. Why? The lesson, my friends, is very important for you in corporate real estate because you are in the business of doing things which change people's worlds. You are in the business of draining a marsh, of reclaiming land, of putting up huge buildings, of changing local ecosystems. How you build buildings is of critical importance. There are huge numbers of single issues associated with building. Just one is child labor. If you're in India, it's a challenge. How do you build a building without any child under the age of 12 getting anywhere near the site and being given maybe a little bit of food? This is a starving child, by the way. This is an orphan, a 12-year-old child. Listen, these, these single issues are very complicated. This is a 12-year-old child who feeds not only his own, his own body every day, but his 8-year-old sister and his 3-year-old brother. And he goes every day to the building site and he begs. And you're the manager there, and you've been giving him a few rupees. And at the end of the day, you realize it isn't helping him, and it doesn't help you. And for his own self-esteem, for his own pride, this 10-year-old boy, who doesn't want to beg, you say, you can sweep the leaves. And uh, here's half a dollar for a day. And then you say to your friends, Actually, there are 10 or 15 of these children. Let them, let them sleep under there at night. Let them sleep there. They have nowhere else to go. And then you say, these kids. Uh, you say, where did that girl go? And you found that she wasn't in the program and she's now selling her body at the railway station. She's 12 years old. And then you talk to another of your friends and you find that the 14-year-old girls have all got HIV and AIDS. These orphans. And you say, this eight-year-old girl here, I don't want her to go onto the street. We must teach these people to read and write. And so you say to your friends, okay, you start, you start making some soup. Every day we give them a meal at lunchtime. They sweep the floor in the morning, and we give them half a dollar a day. And uh, we'll feed them, uh, we'll wash them, they can sleep there, and we'll teach them. And we'll teach them how to sew, we'll teach them how to count, and we'll give them a future. But my friend, if you work for Nike, you had better watch out. In fact, the whole of Nike had better watch out. In fact, it may be that Nike has outsourced a factory to you. And you are a supplier to Nike of that facility. And you have made a decision for the sake of those children to do something which helps you to sleep at night. But if that issue, which may well be the right thing morally in that small Indian village, becomes part of a CNN story, then Nike share price will fall by 15% in two hours. These are big issues. And the point is this, that the emotional energy of the issue, you know, you could have a situation where the story isn't even true. You simply talk to a friend, you said, you know, I have been thinking about it. I know I can't do it. So my wife and I are funding an income generation project for these kids on the other side of town. So it's nothing to do with the Nike factory. And it still gets in the press. 
and the still they send CNN down here because they have heard that you're employing children. It isn't. It's your own money, out of your own money you're paying for an income generating project, the other side of town, 10 miles away, but they've got it tangled up with your name. And now they're saying that you're employing these children inside the factory. Okay, these are challenges. So even where the facts are on your side, and even when the ethics are ones that people the other side of the world can accept, because there's a big challenge, whose ethics? Whose employment standards? Even when all the facts are clean and clear, you can find yourself caught up in a debate, as Shelf has done, uh, with things running away from you, outside of your control. So, listen, my friends, single issues are really, really important. Here's another one. The backhander or the bribe. Or, or the, um, whatever it is. The language is different, and the arrangements are different. And, uh, but you know what it is. It's, uh, something that is difficult to talk about in Europe, but in a fact of life in some other parts of the world. How do you handle these things? What is your ethical code? A transparency, integrity, how do you work in these kinds of situations? These are going to be very, very important. They are already. And of course, this brings us on to the final phase, ethics. How do we live in a world? This is difficult for us. It's changing so fast that by the time you have half planned the HQ, the company has changed. How do you live in a world that's so urbanized with tremendous social and political challenges, uh, so tribal with its forces, uh, and so globalized that we feel we're losing our identities, so radical that small numbers of people can uh, win huge media power? And by the way, uh, single issues also mean it's difficult to do business with government. In the old is you could go and have a meeting with a, a representative of the Prime Minister himself or the Department of Trade and Industry and you come to an arrangement and you say we know that you are um, hoping to win the next election I just want to be confident assuming that you do win the election what will your policy be to these kinds of business arrangements for corporate real estate in this city and the Prime Minister says well of course it's in our manifesto it's stated and it's clear you can be confident, unless the opposition win, of course, but if we win, you can be confident about exactly where you stand. But in single issues activism, what it means is that a small number of people can change things overnight, and suddenly government policy changes. And you say, well, what happened to the manifesto? <laughs> well, of course, we have to live in the real world. And the world has moved on, and political feeling has moved on, and I'm afraid that I can no longer honor the private arrangements we came to before. You see, my hands are tied. So these are all reasons why we have to understand um, this most important radical faith. And the radical faith is connected to ethics. Because, of course, where do you get the power for the single issue from? It comes from our ethical values. Family, relationships, stability, being loved, being appreciated, our own culture, uh, having a sense of mission and purpose. These are timeless things, in fact. But values will make or break your corporate real estate business. Um, as I said, in a hundred different ways, especially in the future. Now, here is an interesting thing. For those who belong to multinationals, I've observed something, which is that most individuals have a different language than corporations. Corporations talk about growth, shareholder values, return on equity, and all the rest. But the individuals talk something else. You know, I don't think I have ever met a CEO or chairman of a Fortune 1000 company that is truly passionate about shareholder value or return on equity or anything else compared to the passion they have maybe for the welfare of their children or for what they will do when they are retired. Do you know why this is? I'll tell you a secret. The CEO of your company is not going to be there very long. In fact, the average life expectancy of a CEO in the UK at the moment is about three years. So how, in fact, if you want the quickest way to lose your job, it's get promoted to be CEO. <laughs> the chairman has, I think, another six months of lifespan on average before he is retired out or kicked out. Or a bullet in his head. And you get a bullet in your head if you go through two consecutive quarters without making your numbers. And then you say, well, it wasn't my fault. The whole market went down 25%. We only went down 23.8. <laughs> 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 
yes, but we were expecting 10% higher than the general market. And you know, every shareholder is putting this unrealistic expectation. So my friends, how can you possibly expect the CEO to feel any great emotional commitment or passion about the future of your organization? Because the organization has zero emotional commitment to your CEO. In fact, your CEO, if he's been in there for two years, has only 12 months left. Uh, not even enough to plan the next budget. Only to take the blame for this, this year's budget. So what we understand is actually, if the CEO isn't even passionate about shareholder value and bottom line profit, then no wonder the workforce couldn't care less about it either. So where is the passion? Well, we find the passion has interestingly moved on. The passion is where it always was. It's with people who feel strongly about their own personal world, about their own lifestyle. Uh, they also feel about family and friends. You'll hear, I think, this afternoon about work-life balance and some of these forces. And why work-life balance is becoming a number one priority in a westernized market. I don't mean necessarily in the West. I mean a westernized market. I mean people who are now in the middle class, uh, highest earning brackets uh, within every culture in the world. Work-life balance is a very big issue. In fact, it's number one in Japan as well as the US, as well as the UK, as well as France. For all those, uh, as the communist career hope for people who leave MBAs, business schools and things like that, including the people at London Business School where I am, we see this challenge. Work-life balance is about family, it's about relationships, it's about belonging, but we also see a passion about, uh, about uh, the community. You know, uh, in Europe and in America and in Uganda and in Burundi and in India and in Thailand and in Japan, you see, despite what people say about the death of society and the mobilization, you see a huge, overwhelming concern about the community which is expressed, in fact, in the work that people do for nothing. Let me ask for a show of hands. I would like you to think about this question. I want you to put your hand in the air if in the last 18 months you have done some work for no money whatsoever. Wait for it. It could be for the old lady who had her hip replaced next door to you so she can't mow her own lawn or get her own shopping. It could be that you work on the board of a local school where your children go. It could be that you shake the tin of the Red Cross or of UNICEF, whatever it is. If you have given time to something you believe is worthwhile in the last 18 months, please put your hand up and wave it hard now. Let's have a look. How many folks? It's almost the entire Cornet community. Give yourselves a wave of applause. Okay, why this? i tell you why. Because this is connected with the real passions that people have. And I know on each table you will learn more about each other in the next two minutes by asking each other what it is that you gave time to than you will have learned in three years of being Cornet members together. In fact, you will learn more than in three years working in the same office just to find out what the passion is. And it's not just what you did, sir, it's why. Because every person has a story. It might be a very personal one. It might be, well, I am involved in the cancer for breast, uh, 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 with a cancer charity. And you say, why? And you say, because a child of mine died of cancer at the age of two. And you have the story. And you have the passion. So we see a passion for individual life. We see a passion for family life. And we see this in work-life balance. We see a real passion, and I see it here in this room, for community. Because every one of you who put your hand up is passionate about community. And then, again, whatever your views are on the war, you see passion when the, in the protests against war, in the campaigns for war, you have seen passion. I'm not talking about the passion of someone who lives in Iraq or in a neighboring country. I'm talking about the passions of um, the people in my children. Our children's school has only 1,000 pupils in it. 400 of those children tried to leave school, was it three days ago? In fact, the school is required by law to teach the children in the school from 9 until 3. They decided they had to call the police to prevent three or 400 of their pupils from walking out of the school together 
to join, not a national protest, this is nothing that you saw about on the newspaper, but to join a little protest of a thousand others who are walking down the street where they live. Now why did they do that? Is it because they are pacifists? No. It's part of a more general thing. Why do people protest about globalization? Is it because they are anti-free trade? No. I'll tell you what these things are about. It's because, just as there is a passion in this room as well for the community, there is a passion in all of our hearts to see a better world. And people may disagree about how you get to a better world, whether you get to it through war or through just talk, whether you get to it through negotiation or a free trade agreement, whether you get to it by process or by persuasion or by power or whatever. But people feel very strongly about building a better world. In China, in the papers today, it's full of it. Building a better world in terms of healthcare globally, in terms of the fight against tuberculosis. Building a better world in terms of economic growth and the global stability. Uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the trading environment. Building a better world in terms of peace between nations. Why is this? Because that is at the heart of a lot of the passions that people have. So we see the companies consume the shareholder value, bottom line profit and return on equity. We see the individual passionately committed to, the, to themselves, but also their families, the community and the wider world they live in. What is the reason for me saying this? This is the reason. If you want to know the ultimate real estate slogan is this, building a better world. Actually, we do this. Every time we build a factory, we create a better world. We build it in a locally sustainable way. We put money back into the economy. We leave that community better off than when it came. We improve the environment wherever we build. We build with locally resourced and sustainable materials. We run that factory in an ecologically sustainable way with the things we make in this factory are honourable. They're good things, made in a great way. We treat people well in the factory where we live. In fact, we not just give individuals a satisfying life, we care for their families, we are into the community, and we create a wider, better world for us all. And in fact, this Building a Better World slogan, I've spoken at many marketing conferences in different parts of the world. It is the our third millennial slogan. It's the basis of every mission statement that you have, it's the basis of every vision and every goal. It's the basis of every passion that people have. And if you can find in your corporate real estate a way of connecting with the passions that people have and bring them into the business, if you can show people that in what you do, you help create a better world for everyone, then you truly deserve to be successful. And finally, I must close. There are two ways of viewing the cube. Toss it all the time and keep turning it because it's very difficult to view the whole future at once. And the cube is weighted. For most of you, the cube is fast. It's to do with the speed of change, or even globalization, to do a universal globalization. But watch this cube, my friends, because it can turn quite suddenly, and fast itself um, can suddenly push it onto another phase. There are two ways of viewing the cube. The dominant way of viewing the cube for corporate real estate professionals is this. A world that's very fast, very urban, demographics, workforce, lifestyle, skills, 